All right. Good morning, everyone. It is 11.59 in the east. It is 8.59 in the west. And it is the Friday, March 11th edition of Lunch with Lincoln. I am your host for today, Reed Galen. My guest today is Steve Russell. Steve had a long and distinguished career in the United States Army, retiring as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was part of the unit that was instrumental in identifying uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, hiding place and ultimately capturing him, uh, plus a lot of other deployments, and served as a member of Congress from the great state of Oklahoma. So, Steve, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Reed. It's great to be with you. So, Steve, um, we were talking a little bit about right before we went live. So, you have a you have an interesting um, background when it comes to what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine between your service in the military, uh, your uh, master's in uh, military history at the uh, Command and General Staff College there in Leavenworth, Kansas, and then ultimately as a member of Congress. So let's start with um, the military side of things. So um, we're two weeks into this war. Uh, Russia, uh, I'm going to say Putin, assumed uh, that his forces, 150,000 or so strong, uh, would dive you know, westward out of the occupied territories that they took in 2014, south out of Belarus, and you and I would be having a different conversation about um, oppression, puppet states, uh, everything else. But now we're seeing that um, the Ukrainians are obviously uh, incredibly tenacious fighters. Uh, mm -hmm. And I assume that fighting for one's homeland always you know, gives you a three, four, five X advantage over uh, invaders. But we're also seeing uh, that the Russian military, um, not the vaunted Red Army of 1945, well, that's, uh, that's certainly proven to be the case. Uh, I'm not surprised by the competency and the efficiency of the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, having seen them uh, in their training environments and a lot of the different uh, exercises that they've been on. My only operational interaction with them uh, was in 99 in, in uh, Kosovo. But uh, I have seen their special operations uh, training uh, facilities and uh, have traveled uh, some in Ukraine and was very impressed uh, with their efficiency. What's surprising is the Russians um, in their ability to coordinate uh, really the various attacks that you would need from both land, air, uh, artillery, and the like. Uh, they're having a, a great amount of difficulty. Their soldiers are brave, obviously. Uh, you know, they continue to advance in the face of uh, stiff opposition and a lot of casualties, but and uh, it's, it's surprising to see uh, the efficiency of the Russian war machine, given their recent operations in Syria. But, there, but the, uh, unlike the United States Army, even when you, were, uh, when you joined, uh, is an all-volunteer force. Um, we haven't had a draft in close to 50 years, probably. Um, the Russian Army is a, is a conscript force. Um, everybody, I assume, most able-bodied young men of 18 or thereabouts join. Right. Uh, so it's a different situation. Mm -hmm. It is. And uh, there's also not the non-commissioned officer corps uh, that certainly the United States uh, Army and the British Army uh, and uh, several of the Commonwealth type nations are, are known for, where you have small unit leaders that are able to take the intent of operations. And then as things break down, they can continue to drive on and, and seize the initiative. You don't see that in the Russian Army. Uh, their tactics are Almost everything is officer led. Uh, so if you manage to whack the head of the snake, you, you pretty much uh, get it all bungled up. And, and that's what we're seeing already. The Ukrainian forces have uh, great intel. They've always had great intel on Russia, um, but we see them striking at a lot of their key leaders. The seventh airborne division commander, for example, that's a crack unit. Um, they killed the division commander. Uh, they've also killed uh, two of the uh, senior generals in the 41st Army. Uh, they killed the vaunted uh, Chechen uh, major general that was in charge of his formation. So uh, they're, they're really getting inside the Russian ability uh, to command and control their elements. So how does that happen? Because as I recall, going back to um, whether or not it was World War I, World War II, I mean, the Civil War notwithstanding, given, given the nature of that conflict. Um, but just thinking about it in the context of American general officers, general officers being killed in combat is an exceedingly rare occurrence. 
They've had now three or four in two weeks. What, what is that telling you about what's going on within the Russian military? It tells me that their communications, uh, uh, secure communications are severely hampered and affected. Uh, they've been trying to uh, employ a new system called ERA. Um, it's not working uh, because it, it relies on three and 4G type of networks, um, but uh, they're knocking out the, uh, the networks uh, with their artillery and, and uh, inaccurate uh, munitions. In fact, they're so inaccurate in the first 72 hours of the attack, uh, they had uh, an estimated seven, eight percent target accuracy of what they were aiming at. Okay, we were upset in 2003 that we only had an 80% uh, accuracy with the uh, munitions that we were launching, wanting it to be tightened up even more. So you, you see a lack of communication. Uh, you see a lack of pinpoint accuracy and precision of munitions. They rely uh, now, uh, much like the old Soviet tactics of World War II, go in and level a city, just dump so much munitions on it, and then you eventually can wander into the rubble after great casualties. It's not unlike Chechnya. It's not unlike what we saw in Aleppo. Uh, so it, it's concerning because Russia still has the capacity to do that with uh, Kiev and Kharkiv and, and other places. But let me ask you this, to, to turn the example of the rubble around, which is, um, and I don't know enough about Chechnya or, or Aleppo other than the destruction of those cities. Um, are you, are, is the Russian army also potentially creating a, a Stalingrad situation for themselves in which they're creating the rubble within which Ukrainian fighters, National Guardsmen, insurgents can hide for days or weeks um, and make it a very bloody occupation for a Russian army? Well, that's, that's already, uh, I think we're seeing that realized when you look at uh, Kherson. Uh, down, uh, you know, close to the Crimean Peninsula and then uh, certainly Mariupol, uh, which is in between uh, the Sea of Azov uh, area and uh, in between Rostov and, and Crimea uh, and in the eastern provinces. Um, they have occupied Mariupol. They haven't been able to take it. And so not being able to take it, then they try to create terror. Um, this causes uh, waves of civilian casualties and, and uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of anger, uh, but it also causes a lot of fear uh, and it also can sap the morale uh, of organizations or it can steal their resolve. Um, what's, uh, what's so criminal about all of this is that none of this was even necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Russia can be often, I think, historically characterized by a simple analogy. They, they are a thief that goes into a, a, a building looking for unlocked doors. And if they find one, they open it and they go in. If they can't stay, they trash the place and they leave. Or they trash the place as they go in. Mm -hmm. We've seen that uh, you know, from Ivan the Terrible, uh, you know, uh, Catherine the Great, the, the Romanov czars, all the way, uh, you know, Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin. Uh, it is their modus operandi. It's not precision. It is going in and and causing great destruction without the same Western mindset of the preservation of human life and civilian casualties. Even though they're signatories uh, to the Geneva and Hague Conventions, we don't see that uh, adhered to uh, like we do in the West. Well, and, and I mean, again, the, the, the history of the, of the Red Army, the Russian Army, um, in occupation is one uh, that I'm sure dozens, if not hundreds of books have been written about. and you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of lives either ended or affected by um, in the last hundred years or so. Um, as you see it now, just leaning back on your military experience for one more minute, um, do the Russians have any other option to, other than to sit back with fixed artillery pieces and high-flying bombers and just wreck things? Do you think that they still have the capacity to really move forward on the ground? I think they're running out of time. Um, you, you're going, and I, I mean, uh, in the short term, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have spring soon. If, if I mean, they're already having some difficulty in off-road movement. Um, you start getting uh, mud in the spring there in Ukraine, it's a showstopper. 
And so they will be restricted to roads. Uh, they will be restricted to uh, a lot of that. They have a very competent uh, Air Force uh, in terms of, of pilot skill. But what, what they don't have is mastery of the air, meaning they can't control the skies. Uh, the air defenses of, the, uh, of Ukraine are, are certainly, uh, the Ukrainian Air Force are certainly capable. And the West has helped in that before this attack, and, and they certainly are resupplying after. Uh, that, that hampers everything. Uh, to include the movement of heavy artillery as it would come up, that obviously would be uh, uh, targeted. But they have long-range missiles uh, that they can dump into cities. And when your target is a city, uh, as opposed to an office in a building of a city, uh, then they can achieve a lot of the rumbling effect, uh, the deterioration of uh, networks and uh, communication, uh, life uh, sustaining public works, all, all of that. Uh, and that I think they will be left to that. And that's, that's what's so very sad. Uh, well, and, and it, uh, you know, just to, to extend your analogy about the thief and the open door um, it's, it seems like there's there's a situation too, which is the door is locked. I'm going to kick the door open. Um, there's somebody in there, but if 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 I can't have it, they can't have it either. I think that there's some truth to that, but you also look at, I mean, geopolitically, there were there were a few things that uh, and historically that Russia feels like they should just have mastery over, not because they do, but because historically they feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Poland, um, the uh, old uh, empire of Lithuania, which is now reduced uh, you know, to a much smaller uh, geographical space, but certainly plays geopolitically in the Baltic states. Um, that would be true of Ukraine. And it would be true of uh, in the Soviet era of anything that was Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. They uh, certainly felt that uh, same desire, but never realized it with uh, Finland because the Finns uh, quite remarkably uh, successfully were able to defeat these types of tactics uh, due to their environment right. and their mastery of their own environment uh, in both uh, 1917 through uh, 1921. And then, of course, in the, in the famous uh, Winter Winter War. Finnish War. So, you know, Finland understands them perfectly. Uh, Ukraine does as well, but it's one thing to try to penetrate trackless forests in uh, unforgiving snow uh, and uh, the vast steppes of wheat fields for miles on end. Uh, so you'll have a window where it's logistically going to be very tough. Right. We might as military uh, thinkers say, well, why on earth would they attack in the winter as opposed uh, you know, the weather gets warmer, the ground is harder. And they thought that they could get a, a quick victory and then they could uh, reinforce. And then when it came time to uh, settle and, and do different things by summer, they would have all of their reinforcing army to deal with the West. It's just not happened. It's not been realized. Steve, there's the, you know, the, <clears throat> there are those, those sayings, you know, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, Mike Tyson, um, you know, famously said, uh, no plan survives after you've been punched in the face. Um, and this seems to be recurring again, which is history teaches us that very rarely once you've opened, or let me say, let me say this, once, once that first infantryman has stepped off, that things are going to go any way you think that they might. Yeah, I, I think uh, Ukraine has a real opportunity to, to save their own nation. Uh, it, time is on their side uh, with uh, 41 million souls, uh, the majority of which have remained. Sure, you, you have a horrible uh, uh, immigration uh, exodus and, and uh, rightfully so uh, with a couple of million people. But most of them are still there and most of the men um, are still there. And they've turned into auxiliaries and um, they are providing information, if not taking an active uh, part. And so you had a, a military that was smaller, uh, but now it's suddenly become the whole nation's military. Right. And you, you see you've seen something similar to that historically when you look at uh, the former Yugoslavia. Um, 
at the end of World War II, they were able to liberate themselves, right. which, which was striking. I mean, they were the only nation that, that liberated themselves from Nazi occupation. Um, so they had that hard partisan tradition and Ukraine also has that tradition. I mean, from the Cossacks uh, to uh, the, the communication uh, to uh, banding together as a people and feeling very strongly about that. Every time that Russia has been defeated by some European power, the Ukrainian people rise up and declare independence. Right. Uh, this is the longest period that they've been able to sustain it. You could argue uh, 30 years, or you could certainly say complete independence uh, since uh, Maidan in uh, 2014, uh, when when they did get rid of an oligarch pro-Russian government, and, and they began to be self-determined. Let me ask you one more question about um, military strategy and tactics, both as, a, as your your role having been uh, a, a combat leader and as a, a historian. Sure. Um, do you think with the advent of things like the javelin being so effective, and the stinger has been around since, since Afghanistan when the Russians were there, um, do you think that has fundamentally changed the way that um, you know, armies would look at this? I mean, it used to be, I mean, you probably fought some battles you know, either, you know, either as an infantry uh, commander or, you know, with armored elements where tank on tank, those sorts of things. But now it's one man with a lightweight, accurate weapon that can take out a 90 ton, you know, main battle tank and scurry back into the woods. I mean, it just seems to me that that that, that the tactics, you know, seemed, you know, R Putin's tactics seem far more ready for the fall to gap of the 1980s than than eastern Ukraine of 2022. Well, I think we're seeing that. Um in, in terms of uh, the long columns, uh, it, it is a mystery as we watch it. But again, the if you look at the penetrations north of Kiev, uh, you had Chernobyl. Okay, so Ukraine was not going to defend that um, because it, it was not something that would be in the long run critical to the defense of the nation. Right. And then south of that, you, you have uh, on the uh, Dnipro, you have the, the vast uh, reservoir that is there. And so they tried to move on either side of that. Uh, and they made penetrations through Chernobyl and through uh, this uh, long reservoir, trying to get on the east and west sides uh, of the river as they approach uh, Kiev. And then the plan was they would uh, encircle Kharkiv and then they would uh, move to the west and link up. But when you look at it in terms of the actual territory, it was almost by its nature limited to um, radiation infested territory from Chernobyl. Right. Um, you have a lot of uh, bridges and rivers uh, that they would have to negotiate, tributaries and other things, uh, which the Ukrainians were adept at, at eliminating mm -hmm. or certainly defending. And, and so rather than being able to venture out into the steppes uh, of, of Ukraine and, and uh, try to expand their advance, uh, they've gotten bogged down from the terrain. And that's going to get worse. And at the end of this month, all the way through May, it, it's they literally will be hitting a, a mud quagmire. So, yes, you, you rush out there with a javelin. Uh, you get the little lock square on the on the vehicle. You hit launch. You run off, and before the thing is even hit, you're you're safe, not even seen. They don't even know where it's coming from. It's a marvelous weapon system, um, and that changes the nature of things. And we also see it with the Stinger missiles, uh, with the close attack helicopters that should be supporting these armored columns. Now they're vulnerable. Um, and so the air superiority with their MiG 29s uh, and their uh, you know, Sukhoi aircraft, uh, 24s and 5s uh, as they come in, whatever, uh, for the ground attack role, well, they have to have the top air cover uh, to hit the resistance points. So all of these are not working in combination because they don't have mastery of the air. On, it's not so much that they don't know the tactics to do, but they can't coordinate it and they've not been successful in defeating some of the Western um, technologies. Um, they have the right idea. They suppose that they would come in and knock out the command and control nodes. They would knock out the um, air defense systems and that they would knock down the Ukrainian Air Force. 
Okay, they didn't realize that. They still have not realized that. So everything else then begins to unravel as a result. So, Steve, let me turn from the purely military to the where the military and the political lines start to cross. Um, we've seen, as you mentioned, three or four generals killed. Do you think, or let me ask you this, do you believe that the, that the general officer corps of, the, of, of Russia is compromised by the nature of the kind of country that it is, in which loyalty to Putin is first, and military competence at least appears to be second. Well, the, if you take the, the deputy commander of the 41st Army, very, very skilled, um, very competent, young. Um, he had kind of made a name for himself uh, in Crimea uh, with his uh, tactics. Uh, but then again, the Ukrainian army did not resist that uh, for geopolitical reasons, uh, the shock of it um, and the like. And then in Syria, he, he made a name for himself as well. So he was Putin's uh, go-to guy. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I can't emphasize how capable the Ukrainian intelligence effort is in being able to read Russian mail. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they just are. Uh, and then that coupled with Western technologies, particularly from the United States and, and Great Britain, um, they're able to to read read the mail and they're able to find the locations and when they divert off of secure communication networks in order to communicate at all and then you have a centralized command and control uh, that, that where you don't have a non-commissioned officer corps or the smallest unit levels young uh, junior officers and ncos making it happen they're waiting for orders they're waiting for diversions uh, their plan doesn't work so they're trying to get orders from on high and they can't and so that's why we see a lot of the, the seizure. In terms of the geopolitical, for a long time, the West was warning. You know, President uh, Biden was, uh, was telling, you know, and they were like, well, how do you know these things? And he says, well, w w we have a, uh, it's a job to know. <laughs> my goodness, it, yeah, it's hooked to my, uh, I had it on silent, but it was hooked to my, uh, <laughs> Hey, listen, Steve, it's live television. Don't even worry. Yeah. So, so, but because, because President Biden said it's our job to know these things. He did. And, and he, he said, we have a, a significant intelligence capability and he was correct in that. Uh, but we should not discount the significant capacity of the Ukrainians. Also, they speak Russian, uh, you know, they've been interwoven into, uh, you know, forcibly through the culture of the Russian fabric. Uh, uh, and history, and then they share hardship. Um, you know, after the four million of them died by starvation with Stalin, and those that remain shared, uh, you know, uh, the memories of the Holocaust. They shared uh, the memories of uh, the Second World War and uh, and the you know the fighting of the Nazi army. So they they had some shared overlap there, um, but that doesn't mean that they feel like like they're a part of that country. And that and that's what. That's what Putin miscalculated on. He he thought that okay, you know they're they're going they're going to roll over like they have in the past, and they will do the things that they should do uh, historically, like they've always done. They'll see that it's too hard. We'll dominate them. Uh, he's been trying it literally f since '91. Uh, mm. He he did it with Yanukovych. Uh, he he couldn't he couldn't quite keep his his Kremlin uh, tied guy in office. And then, you know, he tried to murder Poroshenko, uh, poison him, uh, that didn't work. Uh, and then now you've, you've got this guy that came out of nowhere politically who has the resolve. Uh, and so now geopolitically, it's changed the whole dynamic. You've inspired the West, you've inspired the world uh, with your stand. I've not seen anything like this historically since probably the Russo-Finnish war in 1939, mm -hmm. where people just admired the tenacity of a nation and, and unwilling to give up. Um, and, I, and I think it's very similar. And I hope the outcome is very similar as well. But as, as someone who has also served as a policymaker, mm -hmm. you, you say, you know, Putin was convinced that the Ukrainians would do X, Y, and Z. But in that same 
in that same passage, you just noted there were a whole bunch of examples of, as to why that would be wrong. So are we now in a position where the, the, the chief policymaker is just believing what he wants to hear and, and discounting what he doesn't? I think you're talking about Putin's chief policymakers. Sure, they fear him. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the country wasn't run by those policymakers. Hasn't been since Putin has been in power. He acquired power through, uh, through wealth, through the oligarchs. Uh, he was able to chip away uh, at uh, the former Soviet republics in the same fashion. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you see it uh, with Ivanovich uh, down in the Republic of Georgia, you know, his, his man in the Great White Castle there in Tbilisi. Uh, you, you see it uh, with Lukashenko uh, and, you know, how he remains in power in, in Belarus and all of that. So he really thought that that was the way that he would keep Ukraine in the fold. And when it didn't work, well, his own power is kept in the fold to the oligarchs. And that's why it's really kind of new territory where you're seeing economic global warfare against not only these oligarchs, but against an economy. And I think there are some geopolitical dynamics in play. Uh, now, Russia has no uh, uh, short history of uh, human rights violations uh, for its leaders to retain power. I mean, it right. doesn't matter whether they were Romanovs or, or uh, Stalinists or, or who. Um, they have no shortage in, in, you know, point the machine guns on the square and open fire. I mean, that, that's so even if there were an uprising against Putin and there very well could be, uh, it would be met uh, ruthlessly uh, historically, like it all said with right. an outcome unknown. Right. And, and again, it's, you know, whether or not it's 1917 or 1990, I guess, um, 1917, much bloodier, as we know, and 1990, less bloody, but le led us to where we are today. So in our last few minutes, Steve, where, how does this work itself out? Well, I think the danger is um, that uh, Putin will continue on this path uh, to great destruction uh, of both Ukrainian uh, civilians, uh, the Ukrainian nation, uh, and then also his own people will be the pariah of the world. And so you've got, you know, scores of millions of people that suffer because somebody is a, a thief and a liar and he's wanting to kill, steal and destroy. Uh, it is truly the face of evil. And you have hundreds of millions of people whose lives are affected in the balance. He could double down on stupid and he very well may. Or he may try to look at this like a, a russo finnish uh, type of uh, prospect. It's like, okay, well, if you give us this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Corinthian isthmus here, and, and if you give us uh, these Eastern territories and you do these things, then we won't uh, go into Russia or go into Finland anymore. Um, I don't know if Ukraine in wanting to t tap off the human suffering and tie this into the end, say, Okay, you can have the eastern provinces, uh, you can have Crimea, uh, whatever. I don't know how that plays out. Uh, those things could be on the table. Uh, but then again, what can't be measured and realized is the resolve of Zelensky right. and the resolve of the Ukrainian people in fighting him. They very well could win this thing. Yeah. Well, listen, um, Steve, I want to thank you for joining me. I want to thank you for a fascinating conversation. Um, I, I, am, I am a history nerd, um, and so I appreciate uh, your ability to bring uh, practical experience. Um, and we should note before we, before we sign off here that uh, Steve was highly decorated during his career in the Army, and so I want to thank you for your service. Um, before we go, guys, we want to show you an ad that we just dropped, I believe, either yesterday or this morning, uh, and then we'll let everybody get to their weekend. So, Felicia, let's go. The 3 a.m. phone call when America and the world face the darkest challenges and the greatest danger. Every president faces that call. Only a few rise to the moment. President Biden answered the call, leading America and the world in defense of freedom. Joe Biden, America's president.
Thanks, everyone. Have a safe and great weekend.